So the bulk of this video is going to be showing you how I steam bent the two top pieces for the Adacule build I've been working on. Even though this is somewhat of a longer video, it's actually a condensed version of this process. There's a lot to know and to learn um, about steam bending, and I have a comprehensive video on all of that already on the channel. So I go through this pretty quickly. I'll try and remember to link that in the description if you want a more in-depth um, discussion about how to build a steam box, um, how to build the forms, how to build the bending uh, stops. So basically I have already a setup for this, but the piece I needed to bend was longer and wider than the setup I already had. So that was just putting together a, a five foot piece and a two foot piece in order to get the length for a new steam box. And then I started making the form. I used just a piece of metal for the arch. And what I wanted to do with this was I was going to pre-bend a smaller piece of mahogany to see if I could even get it to work. And then I would do um, a bigger piece. So I'm making this form. It's two pieces of half inch ply so that if this does work, I could break it apart and make a more traditional style form. The reason I was nervous this wasn't going to work is if you watch that in-depth video, you really, the way to steam bend wood is to start with the proper material, and that's going to be usually a more coarse grain textured lumber like oak, and it's going to be green lumber, so the lignin in the wood hasn't yet set. This is a fine grain lumber, and it's also, I believe this company, all their lumber's kiln dried, so in theory this shouldn't bend well, which was what I was um, concerned about. So I decided to try and pre-bend a smaller piece of wood. That's what this is. If I couldn't get this to bend, there was no way I was going to be able to get the longer, wider piece of wood to bend. So I was fairly successful with this. I was happy with the way it turned out. And like I said, I can now use this form for um, my longer process. So that was basically all that was, testing to make sure I could get this to work. I put my form on top of the piece to make sure I, it was wide enough. And it's a little bit, you basically want to over bend the lumber a little bit because it's going to spring back when you take it out of the form. So this shape wasn't perfect. It's actually a little bit of a tighter curve so that when this springs back, it's closer to the shape I need. And then I just went through, um, there's really a, not a ton of math for this. Basically, I put these holes for the clamps somewhat close together and then these holes to make the form also somewhat close together. You do want a lot of coverage for this without getting too close to each other. And then I'm just uh, cutting up some scrap piece of two by six. I was using this for another project. I had some scrap. I'm going to rip this into strips in order to, to make my form. So like I said, there's a lot of tension applied in this. It's a very in-depth process. And I usually, I think it's a very cool process and I enjoy doing it, but I try and avoid it as much as possible in the shop because you could see how long it takes, how much material it takes to bend one piece of wood. I'll most likely never need this exact arch again. So all of these forms are pretty much worthless. I'm going to be throwing them out. I don't have space in the shop to keep them. So that's why I try and steer clear of steam bending if I can. It's a lot of work and a lot of expense for a one-off bend essentially. So my ideal for this was I wanted to build a bending form and a drying rack in one jig. Otherwise, I would have had to make two of these. And like I said, this is pretty big. This is, I think, a six foot long piece I was bending. This is a lot of material. So I essentially made these cantered levered slats, and I was hoping that would work out as a drying rack and a bending form. And then I'm just going to attach some slats on the bottom as well so that this there's a lot of force applied to this form. So it needs to be as sturdy as possible. So this is basically what um, I came up with to, to start this bending process. Now this is an example of a bending uh, strap that I had where I was bending two inch oak and the importance of this you can see how heavy duty it is. I wanted to give you an idea of what this should look like because the one I made was not nearly as beefy and that is because like I said it's just a lot of money into this stuff. It's a lot of hardware. You, I used blue spring steel for this strap which is really expensive so if I bought an eight foot inch piece of this it probably would have cost over a hundred dollars i didn't want to do that for one bend but this is more so an ideal of what an official bending strap looks like 
and you'll see the one that I made and I kind of had my fingers crossed it would work because this is a much more inexpensive piece to build and less time consuming. So my basic concept was I was going to use three pieces of metal. This is just metal I got at Lowe's, um, eighth inch, I believe an inch and a quarter wide and long enough for my strap. And then I was going to bridge the gaps I had with a piece of flashing, hoping that that would kind of fulfill the what I needed for this without breaking the bank. So for the edges, I'm using just some oak I had laying around the shop. And you can see it's one smaller piece butted up against one back piece. What's going to happen when you bend this wood is there's lignin and cellulose fibers in lumber and the heat will soften that lignin. That's why I say this usually doesn't work very well on kill dried lumber because the lignin's fully set at that point. In green dried lumber, the lignin's still somewhat loose, so it's easier to reheat it and get it to move around on you. But once that lignin softens, it gives enough space for the cellulose fibers to move, and that's how you can bend it. So that's why it's important to start off with the right materials, and it's important to make um, a strong strap. That The wood blocks, what's going to happen is as you bend the wood, the outside arch is going to stretch, and that's where you'll get it to splinter and come apart if you don't have a solid backing holding everything in place. And the inside part of the arch wants to compress, so that's where you'll get wrinkles and bubbles if the form um, isn't made properly. So that's basically the very quick version of the science behind this. The strap keeps all of the movement in the wood compressed, so it bends without blowing it apart. Um, and like I said, you can see I just I'm putting these three straps within this this block of oak I have. Obviously, you could tell it's not nearly as big as the other one. But like I said, I was build I was bending two inch oak for that. This at this point I decided to split my lumber in half, so I was bending very thin lumber in a very slight arch. Um, I don't think this would have worked otherwise because of the reasons I have said before, specifically this being the wrong type of lumber and it already being fully dried out. Um, and then you just have to sink these eye bolts in here. The eye bolts are what are going to be connected to the ratchet that is the main pulling force on this whole thing. Um, this is really a two-person job. I always do it by myself because I don't have um, someone working for me. So the ratchet comes into play because that's a such, essentially a second set of hands. And then I could clamp everything down, and this is basically what I came up with. Like I said, after that first test trial and the fact that this wasn't the, uh, the proper lumber to use, I decided to split my boards in half. I needed two bends anyway, so um, it was going to be a little bit more work down the line building it this way, but I didn't think I'd be able to bend a full 13 16 inch piece of this dried mahogany um, no matter what I did. And then I cut this, like I said, in half, but this was about eight inches wide. My saw will only do six inches, so I'm left with a little bit in the middle. I started using a hand saw on this. It got quite tedious. So then I just used a saber saw to, to remove the material in the middle. And you're only going to see one side of this board, so this inside edge that's a little rough, I just sanded it and it, it ended up working out pretty nicely. So those are my two pieces. This is what, like I said, the ratchet. I got this from Harbor Freight. Works quite well. The only issue I have with this, and it's it's not designed for this, the handle sticks out that one side, so it's hard to mount it without it hitting a tabletop. And then I did a little bit of a pre-bend without the wood to make sure everything would work. I used chains um, as my source so that I don't have to worry about them snapping. And you could see I was going to have a little bit of an issue with this catching on the table. This was another thing. I needed this ratchet strap kind of mounted off center so I could move the handle. And you need a very sturdy base because like I said, there's a lot of force pulling on this. I obviously was not going to drill into my table saw top. So I decided to use my outfeed table because this form is screwed into the outfield table so it can't move. That's kind of why I have this weird diagonal setup. On the top I'm going to be securing everything with clamps and on the bottom I'm going to be securing everything with these wedges. If, if I had, you can design it in a way so you can get clamps on the top and the bottom but this was kind of what I was left with in my shop. 
and then I just turned on the steam the the steam and the steam bender like I said I had this whole setup I had I'm using um, a wallpaper remover from Lowe's I've had it for years I've bent quite a, f a bit of, of wood in that box all I had to do was make a larger container than the one I had and then this is that piece of flashing on um, my my bending form now when I was trying to get this out it wouldn't come out and this was about an eight eight inch wide board and the the metal I'm using is about eight inches so I thought it had expanded enough that it got stuck in there I was finally able to get it out from the other side and I'll show you what happened and I was able to fix that in the second bend so then all I did was I attached my piece to my form and then this is what happened I when I connected these I didn't clean out this the seal in the middle so a piece of the wood was actually got stuck in that lip and I wasn't able to get it out luckily the second bended piece of wood only has to be six inches so I was able to rip that piece off and then this is that piece in place the second bend is where I'll get a better camera view of this the one problem with filming for steam bending is you have a very short amount of time to bend this stuff especially since it took me so long to get it out of the steam box so I didn't have time to move the camera on this first bend so this is basically um, what I'm going to do now is move this one up to essentially what I'm calling the drying rack and then I could bend the second piece this was the part I was hoping would work. Like I said, I didn't want to make two forms to kind of loosen the ratchet enough that it was still keeping tension on this. This stuff will spring back very quickly. You want to keep it clamped um, for at least a week. Um, you could take the form off after about an hour, but you want to keep it clamped on some sort of, you could take the bending strap af off of after about an hour, but you want to keep it clamped on some sort of form for at least an hour. So this is the second piece out of the, the box. You can see how I have everything set up. I put that wedge in the center. This, that's roughly where the center is. I put the clamp on the top. I could pull my chains to my strap and I could start bending this. Now you can see there's gonna be a lot of times where I have to come and make slight movements. But since the first one bent um, after having that time with it stuck in the, in the, in this in this in the steam steam box which felt like forever in real time I was pretty positive that I'd be able to get this one to work you can see I'm just making sure everything's staying flush you want this to stay flush on the table you can see this is actually pulling my table saw that's how much force is being applied to this and once I had it in its rough shape I could just go around and clamp everything like I said you could see I have the piece of wood clamped to my bending form that's really important so it doesn't pop out and this was pretty this was a pretty slight arch and like I said it's very thin material so that's why I think I was able to get this to work I'm fairly positive if I have tried this with full-size 13 16 inch lumber it would not have worked and that is what that looks like and like I said I was pretty happy obviously with how all this worked out um, so I cut some corners with making my form and my strap for for purposes as I've mentioned earlier so I was happy with with how this turned out and then I let this set up overnight like this he come in the morning and remove the ratchet and I could take the form off of this back one the um, aluminum flashing on there won't stain the wood if your wood is up against um, um, certain metals it will stain the wood so you might not want to keep your form on there overnight you could take it off after about an hour and then I could just clamp this to the form. And like I said, I let this dry for at least a week. I know people that let stuff dry longer, but this is all going to be glued to um, moldings and whatnot. So it won't really be able to bend once it's all formed into its final shape. It'll be, it'll be glued to other pieces that will support it. And then in order to use my clamps, I just kind of added these slats. My camera cuts off, but I added these slats in place so I could take some of my clamps off and, and let this dry. So while that was drying, I decided to finish up the moldings on this piece. So there's some moldings up top. And then I was also going to put the moldings on the pilasters as well. So this one up top is, is similar to the, the OG molding I made before, but it is slightly different. But it was similar enough that I could start with the OG build and my router table, which I'm planning on moving that, making a new one and moving that, 
was kind of blocked by this whole project. So I just clamped a, sh a straight piece of this mahogany to my table and that's how I cut all this stuff. So like I said, it was a similar enough profile that I could remove the bulk of the material with it and then clean it up a little bit. So that is what I am left with. And then I could rip this down on the, the table saw. So that's how I got those moldings. I didn't need them a lot. I just needed enough to wrap around that cornice. I think I only made one strip of this. And then it's going on the cornice, so I need to put that five degree angle on the back. So that's what this is, adding that five degree angle so it will meet properly where the, the, the front of this meets the, the top of the cornice. You could see that angle there. And then the profile of it matches the crown pretty closely. And my OG bit left a, a, a little bit of a thicker profile. So you can see I put a pencil mark for the material I had to remove. I removed the bulk of it on the table saw. So that left me with a little bit of a flat top there. And then all I had to do was round it over a little bit to finish that up. So I just did that with a hand plane. It was very simple. These small little subtle curves like this are very easy to 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 form and finish up with with a little bit of a of a hand plane. And then that is what that looks like. I could sand it smooth, and then I can install this. So finished profile there, it matches the drawings pretty well. And they had told me within reason to get these moldings as accurately as possible, but they weren't gonna be super crazy about it matching perfectly. So then in order to cut this stuff, I have it at a 45 degree, but then the back I have it beveled to five degrees because the whole cornice is on that angle. So my two sides where the miter meets, it has to be at a five degree angle. So that was pretty simple stuff. Um, at this point, that cornice, that five degree angle, I had to make changes for all of it. And that was easy. It was just these three pieces, the one run across the front and then the two sides with the angle. And then that's what all of that looks like. I also finished up the plasters at this point. If you've been watching the series, you know I pre-made this molding because it's also on the bottom decorative part of the windowsill. And once again, very simple. I just framed this out. I like to do this one piece at a time. You can see I put the top on, measured the side. The bottom, once again, has to be cut at an angle because the sill is at an angle. So you can see I had to add an angle to the bottom of the, the piece that meets the sill. But once again, pretty simple. I put the angle on there and then I can mark where to cut that miter and then attach that as well. So there's that piece cut. I can put that in place and then mark and measure for my last piece. And, and that's how those were done. The nice thing about this is the edges where that um, lock miter bit were weren't perfect and i knew that they would be covered so this was nice this kind of really finished it off because it covered some of those spots that didn't turn out perfect with the lock miter and then the crown i posted in separate videos um, because it was a longer process so i posted those two videos on wednesdays the last two weeks um, if you didn't see those if you want to know how i did the crown